Okay, I just wanted to draw your attention to the screens. Uh, there's a special evening taking place tonight in Student Mission Fellowship, SMF. Uh, and so as a little preview for this evening, uh, we have a video for you for the next couple minutes. Hey everyone, we wanted to send you guys a video and let you know what we've been doing overseas and let you know how much we appreciate your prayers and your support. Thank you guys, we love you, may God bless you and enjoy the video. invite you to SMF tonight to hear the story of Sky and Noel Barkley as they share about what God is doing in and through their ministry. I also want to invite you to uh, a couple of additional things. Tomorrow is the kickoff for our Barnabas groups, okay, our kickoff for the Barnabas groups. 
We also have the kickoff for the renewal. It's a time of discerning and listening and being obedient to uh, the, the call and the voice of God. That's going to take place from 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon on Thursday out here in our Grace Chapel foyer. It'll be about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Come, uh, pray, and learn to pray. Uh, with your fellow students. Last thing I'll point out to you, you'll be getting some more information today on the 40-day journey into Christian friendship. Really encourage you to consider being a part of that. We're about two weeks away from the kickoff. Um, Check that out, and if you'd like to be a part of it, go ahead and contact the Office of Spiritual Formation, and we will begin that process here soon together. Now I want to ask you to calm your voices and to prepare your hearts and your lives to worship this morning. We'll start here in Just a moment. I do welcome you here to Grace Chapel, where today we come together to practice community worship, right? That's what we're here to do. I want to just ask you to pause for a moment. And as you pause, I want you to kind of go ahead and put your things away. Begin to focus your heart and your attention as to the fact that we're gathering this morning in the very presence of God. God is here. God wants to meet us here in this place. We've been praying for many months now, but particularly as a community, for an awakening here on campus. And we're about halfway through our awakening series. And so I want to invite you to be intentional this morning. And what I mean by that is to really prepare your heart for spending time in the presence of God this morning. And as you do, to begin to open your heart and your life to Him in new and fresh ways. To say, God, I want that awakening that you desire to bring in my own life. Would you continue that awakening in me today? Or might God, you begin that awakening in me today? I want to encourage you as we come before the Lord this morning to do so intentionally and to open our lives wide to the work of His Spirit as we gather in the presence of His Spirit this morning. Yesterday we finished off our time talking about growing into the image of Christ. A prayer, God, make me more like Jesus. We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday and to pray that this morning as we sing. So I want to invite you to stand. And as I pray, let's make this our prayer together this morning. Heavenly Father, for the work that you have done in Jesus Christ, your Son, we give you thanks. For the continuing work, Lord, that you're doing in and among us here through the power of your Holy Spirit, we give you thanks. But Lord, this morning, in addition to our thanksgiving, we want you to know that we yearn and we long to be drawn deeper into the life of your Son. And by the power of your Spirit, O God, for your life, the life of your Son, to be shaped in us. Continue that work in us this day. Awaken us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Family of TFC says, let us worship with all of our hearts this morning. 
As we worship the Lord this morning, I invite you just to close your eyes, um, to clear your minds, and learn, and let's just focus on the name of Jesus this morning, that he's the only one that can satisfy, and let's remember that what he's done on the cross for us. says nothing the king of all kings came to serve washing my feet covering me with your love sing it up if more of you means less of me take everything yes all of you is all I need Take everything Give my life for my treasure The one that I can't live without your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. Oh, he meets your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. His love of you means less of me. Take everything. Yes, I is all I need. Take everything. Sing that again. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Oh, oh, oh. Sing! 
we're so thankful that we get to be here to worship you. Would you help us to just be open to what you want to do in this place, Lord? We love you. Come on, let's worship. I hope it's safe within your name. This we know. This we know. You promise never to forsake. But you begin to sustain. This we know. This we know. Come on, let's sing. Hands up, we'll call upon the
so thankful that we get to call on your name. Lord, no matter what we're going through, whether things are good in our life, whether things are confusing in our life, Lord, you are always there for us to call on your name, Jesus. And we know that when we need you, you are there. That we don't have to wait, we don't have to doubt for a moment because we know that you have conquered death, that you have conquered every single stronghold and trouble we might be facing, Lord. God, you are good. And we know that you are for us, Jesus. So we ask that you would just help us to worship you. Would you help us to lean into you in our everyday lives, Jesus? And would you help us to take what we learn about you and apply it to our walks with you, Jesus? We love you. We're so thankful that we got to worship you. So we give you all the glory, all the praise. It's in your name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. As we continue to worship this morning, I'm excited to have Dan Bowl with us today back on campus. Dan is an Alliance Youth Consultant, and so he'll be here. You'll see him around campus. Make sure you say hey. Uh, he also has a friend named Pete who's going to be back with us here in a couple of weeks. When you see Pete, say hey, Pete. Uh, you want to say hey to Pete and make him feel welcome uh, throughout this day. Dan's coming to continue this Awaken series with us. We talked yesterday about our lives being drawn into the very story of Scripture. And as our lives are drawn into the story of Scripture, one of the most important things for us is for us to begin to listen to what God is doing, watching for how He's at work, so that we can participate in that work. But it requires listening, and it requires a heart for obedience in order to be a part of what he's doing in the world. And so I continue to invite you as we continue to worship today to listen with an open heart as to what God might be saying to you. And I want you to be courageous this morning and respond. Amen? Here's Dan. Well, good morning, Tacoa Falls College. You look all so wonderful and cheery to be awake at 10 a.m. in the middle of your school week. Uh, I remember a college, although it was many moons ago, but it's, there's just so much life and energy here as I look at the potential that God has instilled upon this campus. And I'm ex uh, really grateful to be a part of this Awakened series. You know, Chris, when he called me a couple months back and invited me to come down, uh, the Lord started to speak into my heart because you may or may not know uh, but this theme, Awaken, is not just a theme being used at the Tacoa Falls College, uh, but actually independently in and of ourselves last February as we were praying and seeking the Lord for the direction of what the uh, Christian Missionary Alliance's large national youth conference, we call LIFE, what the theme should be. The theme for 2019 is Awaken, right? So the theme comes to us in February for Awaken. Chris and his team independently come to this theme, Awaken. Uh, what you may or may not know also is that the mission's emphasis for all of the Christian Missionary Alliance for the next two years in our local churches, they sought the Lord, and guess what the Lord brought them with? The theme, Awaken. So here's what we have to kind of look at is uh, the reality that if the Lord is speaking to the next generation for youth, the Lord is speaking to Tacoa Falls College, the Lord is speaking to the theme uh, of our missions conferences with this word, Awaken. And then I think last week, one of the students here, I think her name is Cynthia Pont du Jour. I hope, I hope I got that right. You were quoted on the Facebook page, and this is what your quote said. It said, I long for our campus to have a deep spiritual awakening. If this is the word that the Lord is putting in the hearts and minds of many people, uh, I would wonder if it would be wise for us to ask ourselves the question, what is the Lord trying to say here, right? What is the Lord trying to say when he's moving in the hearts and the minds of this many people? Lord, what are you trying to say to us? And this reminds me of the story that we can find in 1 Samuel chapter 3. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app and you want to turn there, you can. It's 1 Samuel chapter 3. It doesn't matter what version you use. But chapter 3, starting in verse 1, this prophet Samuel, this is the prophet who had the opportunity to anoint King David. Prophet Samuel, his first and second Samuel, two books of the Bible. He's also one of the only people in the Bible where we are given his story as a child. Okay, so this is how 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 starts. It says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under the priest Eli. In those days, the Lord of the word was rare, and there were not many visions. 
That's how it starts. The Lord of the word is rare, and there are not many visions. In other words, Eli, who was the high priest, who was supposed to be listening to the Lord and hearing his voice, wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Because Eli's whole job as the high priest was to stand before the Ark of the Covenant, to go before the Ark occasionally throughout the year into the tabernacle, stand before the, the Lord and hear what he was supposed to hear from God and tell the people. So Eli's job was to hear from the Lord and then to hold the people of Israel accountable to what the Lord wanted them to do, according to what was set out before them in the law, but also according to what the Lord was speaking to him. But yet in those days, words from the Lord were rare and visions were not common. And yet here we have this boy. He's probably 11 or 12 years old. He's serving under Eli. He's sleeping in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. If you look at the story, he's sleeping in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. And here's where the story continues. It says, Then the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli. And he said, Here I am. You called me. But then Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and he laid down. You can imagine a grumpy old man being woken up, right? It's like, dude, kid, go away. You're bugging me. I have five kids, by the way. I do this every single night, all right? Verse 6, again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and he went to Eli and he said, Eli, here I am. You called me. And Eli said, no, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. I did not call you, my son. Go lay down. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Man, that is so important. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Guys, he's a 12-year-old disciple under the high priest of Eli. He's been under Eli for 12 years. You would think somebody at some point in time would have told him how to hear the voice of the Lord. Yet for 12 years, nobody told him how. And so this is the first time he's hearing the voice of the Lord. So the first time he hears the voice of the Lord, he just cannot recognize it. So finally, a third time... The Lord called Samuel. Samuel, get up, went back to Eli, said, Eli, what do you want? I'm here. Then Eli finally realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now, I have to ask the question after reading the passage. If we have three different themes called awaken throughout the Alliance family on the Tacoa Falls campus. And here we have this parallel story where Samuel was called three different times by the Lord. How many times must God speak before we finally get woke? How many times? Is it three times? Is it four? Are we able to listen to what the Lord is trying to tell us? Samuel here had to listen three different times. He didn't recognize the voice of the Lord because he wasn't used to listening to the voice of the Lord. It wasn't being modeled for him by the people in his life, specifically Eli. Eli was not listening to the Lord, and therefore neither was Samuel. Samuel was not able to listen to the Lord because his, the one who was supposed to be discipling him was not listening to the Lord. So God in his grace, this is so good about God, God in his grace pursues this young man three separate times. A young man who was not stuck in his ways enough, He was not concerned about the political agenda of the nation. He was not so enshrined in his own self-image. He was not so concerned about his position among the people that he was open enough and young enough to be shaped and molded enough to actually first time be spoken to and hear the voice of the Lord. And the Lord speaks to him three times, wakes him up three times from his physical sleep so that he might be able to respond with that phrase, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, and then be woken from his spiritual slumber. See, Eli and Samuel had been in a spiritual slumber, and yet God chooses to awaken in Samuel, awaken in him this desire to listen, and then out of listening, be obedient. Because when the Lord speaks, we only need to have one response, which is say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. And when he gives you the word, your responsibility is to respond to the word. So Chris gave me the charge to talk about kindling a heart of obedience. It will not be possible for you to have a heart of obedience until you can first hear what the Lord is asking you to be obedient to. So I want to turn real quick to Philippians 1.27. Because I believe that obedience and being obedient to what the Lord is trying to speak to you to do starts with an understanding of your position in the kingdom of God. If you are a follower of Christ, 
then that means you are a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. Your position in the kingdom of heaven is that of citizen. You are a citizen under the lordship of, the Lord, of, of God Almighty. So Philippians 1.27 is an encouragement from Paul to the church in Philippi. He says this, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. I want to take a, a second just focus on citizenship, because citizenship is an identity issue. You probably don't often think about your citizenship as a citizen of the United States of America. If you are one, you're probably not something you think about too often. But right now, you may or may not be fully aware, but citizenship is a pretty complex issue in our nation. Wouldn't you say so? I don't know if you follow politics at all, but citizenship is a really big deal, and we're wondering how to go about doing citizenship appropriately and what, you know, so on and so forth. Now, my personal experience with citizenship uh, occurred about four years ago, and I had a student who was in my youth ministry, and her name uh, was Gabby. Now, Gabby's mom and dad had met 15 years prior, and uh, her dad was an illegal immigrant. Her mom was a citizen of the United States. They met, they fell in love, they got married, yet for whatever reason, her dad did not continue to pursue citizenship, although he probably should have. But for 15 years, he lived in the United States as an illegal resident, and while he was here, uh, they had a whole family, they bought a house together, he had a job, until one day, he was driving down a road, he got pulled over by the police. When he got pulled over by the police, it started a whole thing with ICE, and ICE got involved, and her dad was deported during her freshman year of high school. Had to go back to El Salvador. So I actually saw a whole family that had been living in the United States for years, living a normal life, be torn apart because of one person's lack of citizenship. It was a very difficult, painful thing to watch. And I don't know uh, if any of you in this room have been affected by DACA or have friends who are working through the immigrant, immigrant process, but if you are a citizen of the United States, my guess is you have not even thought about your citizenship in a long time. Because it's just a part of your daily existence. And here's what I learned watching Gabby's family go through this whole process. First thing is this. Citizenship has immense value. It has immense value. You don't even know the depth and the value of your citizenship that you probably possess if you have it. But here's the other thing about citizenship. Citizenship is extremely hard to attain if you are not born a citizen of the United States here in this country. There are so many hoops to jump through. Now, here's the thing. I was born a citizen of the United States. Probably many of you were born as a citizen here in the United States. And you did not have to work or do anything to earn your citizenship other than the fact that somebody was, that you were born here because somebody before you got here. Which tells me then that somebody before you, in my case, my ancestors in the early 1830s, 40s, who immigrated from Spain and Ireland, they did all the hard work of becoming a citizen so that the generations after them wouldn't have to. This reminds me a lot of our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Well, our citizenship is extremely valuable, and we attained it at someone else's expense. And so what does it mean then to live as a citizen in the kingdom? Because we have this immeasurable value given to us that sometimes we neglect it. We don't even understand the depth of the value of the thing that we possess because Christ was willing to do the hard work to live a perfect life, to die a sinless death, to be resurrected through the power of the Holy Spirit, to then pass on to you an inherited gift of kingdom citizenship if you choose to accept it. And yet, sometimes we don't even understand the value of it. It means that we cannot boast in our works, we cannot boast in our religiosity, we cannot boast in our Christian behavior. We can simply boast in the fact that Christ himself did the work on the cross. And so you, as citizens in the kingdom of heaven, have to understand two primary things. You have rights as a citizen in the kingdom of heaven, and you have responsibilities as a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. I think this is just such a, a fascinating thing that God gives us rights, but then God gives us responsibilities. God says you have all these freedoms, and here's what I want you to do with these freedoms. Here's how I want you to use them. You have rights. Now, in America, if you're a citizen of the United States, you have a bunch of rights too, right? Uh, you enjoy immense freedoms. Uh, now, you have the responsibility, though, of paying taxes to enjoy those freedoms. Anybody filing taxes yet for the first time? Oh, come on. You guys don't have any jobs. You're not filing taxes. Help me out, people. I know you're, if you haven't filed taxes yet, just wait. It's coming for you, okay? It's, it's not a very fun process. But you have the responsibility the expectation, the obligation to pay taxes to enjoy the rights in which you have. You have to be obedient to paying taxes, and if you're not, there are 
consequences. Did you know that even if you get sent to prison and you get a prison job making 12 cents an hour, you still have to pay taxes on the 12 cents an hour that you earn in your prison job? Do you know why? Because you have the right to a free society safe from criminals, so therefore you're going to get taxed to keep yourself in prison. Okay? This is what it means to be responsible. You're obligated. You have obedience ahead of you. You have the rights, but you also have the responsibility to follow the laws that are over you. Now here is what it looks like for a citizen in the kingdom of heaven, right? Because here's the deal. We don't live under the law. We don't live under the Old Testament. We live under a covenant of grace that all of these freedoms, all these rights are given you because somebody already obeyed and fulfilled all the legal requirements. Therefore, what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is simple. Out of your gratefulness for the hard work of what Christ accomplished for you, that there's no way you could do it for yourself on the cross. It means that you then have a heart that says, Lord, because you did what I couldn't and brought me back into the fullness of unity with God himself. And in my gratefulness out of that, I am willing to then listen and obey wherever it is, whatever it is you're telling me to do. Because my citizenship is something I could never have attained on my own, and I have it, and there's amazing responsibility and rights that come with it. First and foremost, a reunited relationship with God himself. And so, Lord, what can I do, O oh Lord, to show you my gratefulness and my, and my desire uh, for the things that I have? And so this takes me back to Samuel. Because we have to listen to the Lord. Your primary responsibility as a disciple of Jesus is to be one who listens to the Lord and then do what he says. Now, Samuel and the Israelites already told you, man, they had it easy. They had the law, and they also had a covenant with the Lord, and it simply went like this. The Lord said, here, follow the law. You will be blessed. You will inherit the land. And implicitly, everybody who lived under the law knows what God expects of them because that's what the law does. It gives you the list of things you have to do, and if you do those things, you will be blessed. For those of you who are in the theology department, the, uh, the relationship is, is called a suzerainty vassal relationship. Has anybody heard that term yet? You're a suzerainty vassal. The suzerain, the Lord, has amazing power, and he can give you all kinds of things, and he lets you have all kinds of freedom and all kinds of stuff within reason as long as you pay tribute and give offerings and keep the law. And so the people of Israel, they lived in this theocracy where God was their suzerain and he, they were the vassal, and if they did what they were supposed to do, God would do what he was supposed to do. And they would see these terms and conditions applied back and forth throughout the history of Israel. In fact, most of the Old Testament, if you look at it, is a terms and conditions relationship where the people of Israel do their part and then God does his part. And that's the entire book of Judges, and you actually read through the story of what's going on there. And so the Lord would then do his part, and he would show that he was doing his part by sending his Holy Spirit upon select individuals throughout history. And they would come on prophets, and they would speak words of the Lord. They would come on the judges, and they would deliver the people from oppression. They would come on the high priest, and he would speak words of obedience to the people. So the Holy Spirit manifestation in the life of one individual was God showing his, his vassals what he was doing to fulfill his promises. And then great and mighty works usually would follow. So the people knew. We're doing our part. God's doing his part. We obeyed the law. We listened to the prophets, priests, and judges. And God speaks, and voila, we said it, we forget it. It's easy. Okay. Today, it's a little bit different. Because nobody in the Old Testament, no one, wandered around asking the question, what does God want me to do with my life? No one. They knew what God wanted them to do. Keep the law, obey the prophets, judges, and priests. If they did those things, they could have any job they wanted. They could live within Israel. They could treat their neighbors well. That's all they had to do. Follow the law, listen to the prophets, uh, priests, and the judges. Now, how many of you have asked the question, what does God want me to do with my life? Man, that is such a common question being in college, right? What does God want me to do with my life? Because now we live in a new covenant. Right? There's no longer the law. There's no longer the prophets, the priests, and the judges to tell you what you're supposed to do with your life. No, now that you're in a new covenant, a covenant that is by grace, God gives all of his promises to you freely because he loves his son, and his son loves you, and then his son fulfilled the law perfectly, and then he died the sinless death, which you should have died, which I should have died, which I still should probably die, but I'm redeemed by grace. Thank you, Jesus. But then Jesus goes above and beyond, not just redeeming us through salvation, but then he gives us this amazing inheritance, this seal, the seal of the Holy Spirit. You see, where the Holy Spirit would come on select people for select purposes, now the Spirit of God is poured out among all those who believe. And so when you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit fills you, that is evidence of the faith that you have in Christ that you have been redeemed, that you are saved. 
And so now you have this Holy Spirit given to you in John chapter 13 through 17. This is the Last Supper. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible because this is Jesus' living funeral. I don't know if you know much about the Last Supper or not, but Jesus is with his 12 disciples. The 12 disciples are hurt. They're crying. They're going to miss their Savior. And he tells them, listen, I am going. In fact, it's good for you that I go away because I'm leaving you this inheritance, my Holy Spirit, who will be your advocate and who will be your counselor. These are the things that you're going to receive, an advocate and a counselor. No longer is there a prophet, judge, or high priest that you have to listen to. You can speak directly with me, and he will speak directly with you. You see, advocates, what do they do? They speak to others on your behalf. The Holy Spirit currently on your behalf is speaking to God the Father for you, advocating for your citizenship, letting God know who you are and where you belong. And therefore, because God is hearing the advocate and listening to the Holy Spirit and believing that and trusting that is the seal of your salvation, God then speaks back to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes on a second role, that of the counselor. And what do counselors do for you? They speak to you. Counselors speak to you. Now, when is the last time you took the time to listen to what the Holy Spirit was trying to tell you? Because he will speak. Because it's his job to speak. He speaks on your behalf to the Father. He hears what the Father says. He speaks it right back to you. He'll do that through the Holy Scriptures. He'll do it to you in prayer. He'll speak to you for no good reason. Out of the middle of nowhere, he'll speak to you through somebody else who has the Holy Spirit living in them through words of encouragement and prophecy. This is what the Lord wants to do. He wants to speak to you, but we have to have the ability to listen. And we have to ha- recognize the voice when it calls. Now, Jesus modeled for us listening to the Father probably better than anyone else uh, on the face of the earth. Uh, he gives us this Ability to pray. If you look at Matthew 6, 13, you read the, the, the prayer, right? So our Father in heaven, hallowed be the name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it, as it is in heaven, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You've probably heard the prayer. This is how Jesus teaches you to pray. And I think a lot of us in our prayer life, we've heard that and we pray, but we spend so much time praying, speaking to God, because the model Jesus gave us was speaking to, to God. But here's what you might not realize. That's one model, but Jesus' whole life was characterized by that of prayer. In fact, over 30 times in the New Testament alone, Jesus is seen praying somewhere, right? Sometimes they were short prayers of blessing, like when he blessed the fish and the bread, miracle happened. Sometimes there were songs of praise. He'd break out into songs of praise towards God. But more often than not, Jesus was away silently with his Father in a quiet place. He was listening And that's why you hear in John 12, verse 49, this is what Jesus says to the disciples. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. That means that every time you open up the Bible, and if you have a red letter edition, every time you read those red letters, those are the words of God himself spoken to his son Christ who then pronounced them to you. They're not just Jesus' words, they're the words of God himself. But he was in a place where he could listen to what the Lord was trying to teach him. Hours and hours and hours upon time spent listening. And so we go back to this story of Samuel in 1 Samuel 3. Because here you have Samuel. He says, speak, Lord, for your servant is what? Say it like you mean it, folks. Speak, Lord, for your servant is what? He's listening. And guess what the Lord did? The Lord spoke. And you know what the Lord spoke? The Lord spoke condemnation over Eli and his sons. And he said, listen, Samuel, I'm going to kill Eli. I'm going to kill his sons. They defamed my name. They're horrible priests and prophets. I don't want them anymore. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Eli, or and Samuel, by the way, you need to tell Eli this tomorrow morning. Okay, 12-year-old kid. So let's pick up the story, 1 Samuel 3.15, right? Samuel laid down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And here's what happened. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Listen to me right now. When you hear from the Lord and he asks you to do something, you might have a heart of obedience, but the natural inclination is to be afraid of doing what God wants you to do. That's what it is. And so while we seek to be awakened and to hear the voice of the Lord, just know one thing, that when you hear it, you'll know that you've heard it when you're afraid to do what it's telling you to do. That's what happened to Eli. Right? Or that's Samuel. He heard the voice and he's afraid to do it. And so what does he do? Like all good 12-year-olds, uh, he had to be coaxed into it. Right? 
Eli's like, listen, Samuel, tell me, what did the Lord say? He's not speaking to me. He's speaking to you. What did he say? So Samuel declares judgment on Eli, and Eli goes, well, okay, so be it. <laughs> the Lord spoke, right? So he shows some spiritual maturity there near the end of his life. But, Eli, or, but Samuel had to listen. Listen, there are some of you here in this room where you have uh, what I would call speaking gifts, gifts of prophecy, gifts of vision, words of encouragement, preaching, teaching, exhortation, etc. And any of you that have a speaking gift need to understand this as a speaking gift. The greatest teachers are the best listeners, hands down. Because you are not speaking your words. You are speaking the words of the Father that are being spoken to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to have the counselor who guides you and leads you and then asks you to be obedient. A couple of months ago, back in February, I was praying with my friend Zach. Zach is a 35-year-old guy. He wants to be a worship leader. And early on in his ministry, uh, he was serving at a church. He was in his early 20s. And the church said, hey, you know what? God's not calling you into this. You're actually being, you're being disqualified from this ministry because of some of your behavior. And he had some issues, and they disqualified him. So for the last decade, he's been walking around feeling like his calling to worship ministry had been removed. Yet he couldn't understand why everything inside of him wanted to be in worship ministry. And so we're sitting there together. We're praying. There's about four of us in the room, and we're praying over Zach. And the Lord gives me a word. Now, here's what happens when the Lord gives you a word. You're kind of cautious at first. Because you're like, is this really the voice of the Lord? If you're not accustomed to hearing it, you want to test it a little bit. And so the Lord gives me this word, and he says, Dan, tell Zach that his calling has not been removed. It's just now being brought to the forefront of his life. And so I, I pray. I'm kind of scared to tell a guy that because, you know, yeah, it sounds good, but what if it's not true? And, but I test the spirit, and I'm affirmed after about three or four more minutes. You need to say this. It's burning my chest. So I say, Zach, listen, uh, your calling has not been removed. It's just now being brought to the forefront of your life. And those words brought amazing spiritual healing and renewal to him. He starts to cry, and he's weeping, and we're celebrating because we know that the mantle has returned for him to lead this ministry. But it doesn't stop there. It gets weirder. So we continue to pray, and I hear the voice of the Lord, and the voice of the Lord says, tell Zach he's going to be in worship ministry by the end of this year. Okay, Lord. <laughs> and I say, Zach, listen, and this is going to sound strange, but you're going to be in ministry by the end of the year. And he's like, okay. And the other guys are like, okay, but let's give thanks to God in case that's true, you know. And we'll have to wait and find out. And we'll give him praise then. So we, we pray and we, continue, and we continue to pray. And here's where it gets even stranger. You ready? The Lord speaks again. And he says, tell him that he's going to be the worship pastor at North Springs Alliance Church in Colorado Springs by the end of the year. Okay, Lord. <laughs> I guess I'll do that. And I did not do that in front of the other guys because I was afraid to say this out loud. Like, what if I say this out loud and they think I'm a crazy person? And what if it doesn't happen? And there's fear. There's fear when you hear the voice of the Lord about telling people what the Lord says because there's danger there if it doesn't happen. And this is a faith issue, right? And so I take him aside and say, hey, listen, uh, Zach, you're going to be a worship pastor at North Springs Alliance Church by the end of this year. And he's like, mm, that's very specific. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is, but the Lord speaks, and it's sometimes very, very clear. And so we, we pray, and whatever, it's February, the, treat, the retreat is over. And here's the thing about North Springs Lions Church, you got to understand, they had a senior pastor and a full-time worship pastor. So there's no reason to believe that this is going to happen in any way, shape, or form. Come July, our worship pastor makes an announcement that he's going to resign. That's July of this summer, which immediately I go, whoo, <laughs> look at that. A couple weeks later, our senior pastor takes Zach out to lunch and says, Zach, the Lord's really impressed on me that you're supposed to be our next interim worship leader. Senior pastor and I had never talked about what the vision that the Lord had given me, the words the Lord had given me. So now Zach, as of two weeks ago, is the worship pastor at North Springs Alliance Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And he was not in ministry at the time. When the voice of the Lord speaks, we are to be obedient and to listen and to act on it, regardless of the fear and how crazy it sounds. Because you're hearing the voice of the Lord. That's what it means to be obedient. Now I'm going to ask uh, Jacob to come up here. We've got exactly one minute. Jacob, hurry up. Run, Jacob, run. Where are you, Jacob? Jacob, start playing your guitar, Jacob. <laughs> it always means more when you underscore. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take these last 60 seconds to quiet your heart and bow your head and just listen. 
and just be silent and ask the Lord and tell him, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This posture is not a posture that has to stay in this room. It is a posture you take with you throughout your entire life as a Christ follower. To kneel and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I promise if you listen, you'll become very familiar with the voice of the Holy Spirit. You'll know when he speaks. And what he tells you to do is going to cause fear and hesitation. But when you do it, you'll be filled with joy. Father God, thank you so much for the students of Toccoa Falls College. Thank you for how you speak, for how you move, for what you're trying to do in the lives of these young people. And Lord, as they go to their courses throughout the rest of the day, let them be awakened to your voice, that they might be obedient to all that you ask them to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day, Toccoa Falls College. Pleasure to be with you. Enjoy your studies.